Let's overclock some AM5, what do you say? Overclocking AM5 on this channel? Well, I think some people are gonna get it wrong. I, there's gonna be a lot of coverage, I think, on launch of AM5 about how certain clock speeds are unattainable. So, just so you know, the advertised maximum of the 7950X, for example, is 4.7 gigahertz. But what everybody will have discovered is that really it's like 5.8, 5.85. In Linux, I was seeing 5.88 because the F clock was pushed just a little bit on the uh, Asus Crosshair Hero motherboard for AM5, the X670E. But it's not just about overclocking. This video is also if you're interested in building a low power ITX system. It's not really underclocking, well, it is kind of underclocking. You can give your AM5 CPU less power and it won't crash, it'll just be a little bit slower. And for the first, you know, 20%, 25% that you reduce the amount of power, the performance fall off is negligible. Secondarily, another thing that I think is gonna work against AMD that shouldn't count against them is that because their AM5 socket is physically compatible with AM4 coolers, a lot of people are probably going to try AM4 coolers on that socket and the AM5 power characteristic is completely different. You know, if you're rocking a 12 or a 16 core, a 7900X or a 7950X, both of which I have for testing on launch, um, that AM4 cooler that was designed for AM4 CPUs probably can't keep up with those newer CPUs because the total socket power now we're talking about is 220 watts instead of 140. In fact, in testing between the 7900X and the 7950X, gaming performance out of the box was better with the 7900X than the 7950X just because the 7900X could do a little bit better in terms of boosts, thermals, and everything else, even though on paper the 7950X is faster. Fortunately, there's a way to get better performance from a thermal standpoint out of your AM5 CPU, and that is the AMD Curve Optimizer. Even if you don't intend to overclock, you could probably get the same or close to the same performance out of your CPU at reduced power using the Curve Optimizer. Pretty much everybody is going to be able to set negative 10. I think, you know, in 99% of scenarios, you'd be able to set negative 10, and that will result in significantly reduced power consumption, which is a significantly improved thermal situation, no matter what your cooling situation happens to be. Overclocking is also not just about the CPU, it's also Infinity Fabric. Infinity Fabric is now designed for DDR5. The sweet spot is DDR5-6000, which is an overclock. The platform supports DDR5-5200, 6000 is the sweet spot, but I also tested G-Skill 6600. My Infinity Fabric wasn't quite fast enough to keep up with that and keep sort of the low latency ratios. But I also tried Team Group, Corsair, Kingston, and several other kits of memory. Now there are two Expo kits of memory that I use, one from G-Skill and one from Kingston, Kingston Beast. Expo is a new memory standard from AMD that's really just a configuration register. Expo says for an AMD CPU, this is the timing and configuration you should use with this DDR5 DIMM. So it's really just a configuration profile that's tuned for a specific DIMM. It's not really that the DIMM is specific to AMD, it's that the DIMM has been well tested on AMD and the Expo profile is going to give you the best possible performance. It doesn't mean that you have to use Expo DDR5 memory on the AM5 platform, it's just that it's perhaps a little bit less headache to use and a little, a little bit less headache to optimize exactly where it needs to be to get the most performance and lowest latency out of the platform. In our Kingston DDR5 kit here, you can see that we have an XMP and an Expo profile, meaning that you could theoretically support both the Intel and AMD platform without any issues for a given kit of memory. Notice also that we have 6,000 and 5,600. Two DIMMs is gonna be the optimal configuration. Four DIMMs is a significantly increased electrical load and logical load. And so you're probably not going to see that DDR5-6000 sweet spot if you want to try to rock four DIMMs. So 64 gigabytes is sort of the upper limit that I would recommend for a two DIMM configuration. And you'll always want to try to err on the two DIMMs side of things. You don't want to try to run four DIMMs on this platform if you can possibly help it, at least right now, today, on the AM5 launch. ASRock also provides some extra options. You can go with the Agiza default or you can go for performance or aggressive. 
This is likely to change a lot depending on BIOS version and some other factors. So you can try aggressive, but for this BIOS version, I didn't really see a lot of difference. Under advanced, we have the AMD overclocking menu. There's a liquid nitrogen mode for you everyday drivers that use liquid nitrogen for your cooling. That's not us. Precision Boost Overdrive. Let's go to that and set Advanced. Now you can override the TJ Maxx. Like that's the first option here. This is the easiest one. Platform Thermal Throttle Limit. It's 95C out of the box. Azrock said we could go up to 115. I have not been brave enough to do that. Now I've already been through a lot of testing with the CPU so I sort of know what it wants but for a curve optimizer here, all we're setting is all cores negative minus 18. Minus 18 is perhaps a little aggressive. I would suggest starting with negative 10 but this is gonna basically keep all the parameters of your CPU exactly where they need to be in terms of boost and the default out of the box algorithm, but it's just gonna ask it to do those things with a little bit less power. We can also change the boost clock override. We can give it you know, plus 200 megahertz, plus 150 megahertz, plus 100 megahertz. This CPU seems to be perfectly fine with plus 150 megahertz. I've also set the PBO limits, the motherboard limits, which means that we're going to probably enter a situation where the CPU is limited thermally rather than in terms of power. Remember the target TDP for the 12 and the 16 core CPU is only 170 watts, which, you know, it'll consume more power than that, but the cooling, well, I mean, you know, TDP is different than socket power. That was true in AM4. But this is also a situation where we're asking the CPU to use a little bit less power to get a little bit more out of it. So we're changing the curve, hence the name, Curve Optimizer. Ah. As you can see, it's stock and idle. This thing is idling at 42 degrees C. Now for the 7950X, if you want it to boost to 5.8 gigahertz, it has to be under 50 degrees C. The way that you get there is not with extreme cooling. I mean, okay, you could get there with extreme cooling, but the way that you get there is the Curve Optimizer and the negative offset. So that's the, the other thing that I think a lot of people are going to get wrong is that I think most people are going to say that 5.8 gigahertz is unobtainable. And it's not that 5.8 gigahertz is unobtainable. You will need good cooling. You're not going to be able to stick the Wraith cooler on this and get 5.8 gigahertz. That's a given. But you can get 5.8 gigahertz out of this platform if you use the curve optimizer and use a negative offset and also use good cooling and you win the silicon lottery. 5.8, 5.85 gigahertz is entirely attainable in that scenario. And it's probably gonna be fairly common. I mean, I don't know, it's a sample size of one. I'm gonna have some more retail CPUs on order, so I'll keep testing. But usually I don't have the greatest luck with this kind of thing, and I don't really enjoy it because it's like a reboot, all my system's unstable, reboot, all my system's unstable, reboot, all my system's unstable. But with Curve Optimizer, Curve Optimizer has been very good about keeping the system stable, but just changing the performance characteristic. And so that's a little bit more tenable in terms of like an overclocking scenario, I think, because I can tune the system, play with it a little bit, and then say, okay, yeah, I need to back off curve optimizer or I need to do this. It usually doesn't introduce instability. Also, there's changes in Ryzen Master that we need to talk about. Now, out the gate, this latency is a little high for this platform. It's pretty easy to achieve 63, 64 nanoseconds, 69 nanoseconds. Uh, it's a little on the high side for what's achievable with DDR4-6000. We can see from Hardware Info 64 that after having just run the A to 64 benchmark that our socket power was 180 watts, which is, you know, not far. It's that's basically in line with stock performance. Now CPU-Z, the default CPU-Z benchmark, if you run this, it's not going to seem like it's any significantly better than Zen 3. Now, that's because the old CPU-Z benchmark was small enough to fit basically in the L1 cache. So not a lot has changed there. The front end is different. So you'll probably want to pick AVX 512 and use that as a benchmark if you're going to use CPU-Z to test you know, how, how much the needle moves. CPU-Z's done a great test for this. You should run a game or something like that, but just so you know. Now for the loop we're using here, we're using a pure loop 360, which is the most economical AIO that can reasonably approach taming AM5 in my opinion. The pure loop 360 is in a weird situation for sure. I mean, it's good. It was historically good for AM4, but it remains good for AM5, and that's impressive considering its price point. Um, if you want something better, you could consider something more expensive. The Arctic 360 cooler is particularly impressive, but thicker radiator, more fans, costs a lot more, uh, but definitely a winner for AM5 as well, although um, you might need a bracket or an adapter or something. I've got a cooler roundup that I'm working on. 
I don't know, we'll see how that goes. Uh, tower coolers are kind of the losers, I think, for AM5. Tower coolers don't respond quickly enough, and very quickly you'll hit that 95 degrees C wall before it can really uh, deal with it. It depends on the tower cooler. Some are better than others, but uh, AM5 is a real challenge for tower coolers. Yeah, we scored over a thousand in CPU-Z. Dang! So for Ryzen Master, I want to call attention to the built-in curve optimizer. It's pretty good. You can still do a better job manually. If you look at what curve optimizer is doing and, you know, sort of what it learns, you can usually do a little bit better job than what curve optimizer does for you if you're willing to invest the time. But it's pretty cool to be able to click curve optimizer and start optimizing and then just let it go do its thing. All right, so here from Ryzen Master, I've started with a minus 10 offset and I'm just letting it validate and run some tests so we can keep an eye on the temperature and see everything else. Minus 10, success. Let's validate minus 20. Notice that as I do this, the peak speed's increasing a little bit every time. And we're now up to 5.3 gigahertz, basically all core. But also notice that our CPU power is not really changing. It's still around 150 watts, give or take. We'll try minus 24. You saw it briefly there, we were at 5.4 gigahertz, but 5.3 and change, I'll take it. Geekbench, 2227, 5.7 gigahertz. What was stock again? I'll take it. It's pretty good. And this is a less power than stock as well. Now, if you're willing to dial more power into it and you have better cooling than a pure loop 360, I mean, keep in mind, I'm on a relatively inexpensive AIO, then you can get even more out of your CPU, probably. Will you get the full 200 megahertz? No, probably not. But will you be able to run your CPU at a higher clock speed with less power? Yeah, probably. Half the fun of overclocking this generation is running your CPU with less power so that you can get more boosts when you need them. That's what this is about. And on the 5950X, that's how you get the 5.85 gigahertz. And I think a lot of people are going to miss out on that. It's like, oh, you'll never see 5.8 gigahertz in stock. Yeah, that's why they put 5.7 gigahertz on the box. But you can do 5.85 gigahertz with this kind of tuning. Curve Optimizer is where your attention needs to be directed if you want to be able to do this kind of thing. Oh, and 6200, at least 6000, but you can probably also get 6200 in there and get even better latency. And these numbers would be even better if I would spend a little bit more time tuning the memory to get uh, a little bit better latency. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at overclocking on the AM5 platform. If you have any questions or anything like that, let me know in the forum, because if there are a lot of questions, or depending on how things actually shake out once I've got more experience under my belt than just two CPUs, I'll do another video or follow-up video that answers questions and goes through the different BIOS options. I've also got the ASUS Crosshair motherboard, which has some really interesting AI overclocking features, but uh, it's not described in the manual and the software, like how-to hasn't been made public yet, and even I don't have that. So I've got to take a look at the ASUS special sauce for their overclocking and, and all that. But that said, I had a perfectly reasonable time with Ryzen Master on our Tai Chi and Steel Legend uh, ASRock motherboards. Pretty pleased with how this turned out. I mean, especially considering this is a 7900X that we're running at 5.7 gigahertz without any issues. So, you know, your mileage may vary. This is overclocking. There's no warranty for the overclocking stuff or even running beyond 5200 with AM5 CPUs. I feel like that, that doesn't really uh, warrant a reminder, but I'll give you a reminder. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums. Let me know. I'll see you later.